I'd like to welcome everyone here to umusic.ca. We've got two members at AFI. Would you guys like to introduce yourselves? I'm Davey Havoc. I'm Jade. Now I want to talk about the new album, Sing the Sorrow. Uh, how long were we in the studio for this? We were in for five months. Five months. Was this unusual for you? Do you usually do things a lot quicker than this? Yes. <laughs> yes, we do. We, it's the longest we've ever spent. Um, as long as we've spent writing, as long as we've spent recording, um, the whole process w was a lot longer than we've ever taken before. Um, but it was really nice because we were afforded more time than we had ever been given before, which really resulted in us being able to reach a place with the end product that we've, we've never really been able to achieve before, um, a sort of level of, of satisfaction on our part. So you brought in Butch Vig and Jerry Finn. How was it working with them, and why did you bring them in? Because you guys are usually like a do-it-yourself type band. You usually produce everything yourself. So why bring in the new guy? Yeah, we, <clears throat> as you said, we were used to producing our records ourselves for the most part. All of our records up until this point have been produced um, on our own. But we really, really were interested in having that sort of outside creative input when uh, you know, you're know you so, so close to a project, it's nice to have an outsider whose opinion you respect come in and, and um, to enhance what you're doing. We, however, were very particular in who we wanted to be that, that outsider. We wanted someone who we respected. Um, and Butch Vig and Jerry Finn were two of those people. Um, it's you know very obvious as to why their 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 skills and their expertise and their history really speaks for them. Um, so it was really a great experience working with working with Jerry and uh, and Butch. It was it was great. There actually was a producer on Art of Drowning. It just didn't really end up being a very good experience. So we were kind of reticent, I think, but. The fact that, I mean, these guys are the two in the top echelon of producers out there, so really, uh, we just figured everything on this album is different. We wanted to do everything to the best of our ability, and uh, I think this was just another um, aspect of that. I just want to ask you guys, do you guys prefer recording in the studio, or do you prefer playing live? I definitely, and why? I definitely prefer playing live. I mean, it's, it's really nice to get the end of the result of the recording, but um, <clears throat> I love to perform. It's it's one of the greatest things in the world to be able to play a different city every night and um, you know to go out there and have the crowd singing along. I, and uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> really, that recording live isn't necessarily a, something that you look forward to doing. What you look forward to doing is getting your music on tape, thereby enabling you to go out and play it. So uh, recording is more work, and playing is actual the enjoyment of being in a band. Now, I want to talk to you about your fans, you in particular, Davey, because you actually have a website called the Church of Havoc, and I'm just going to read a quote from this. Um, there, should, there is only one truth, Havoc's truth. We shall all be straight edge. We shall all be vegans. Our whole life is a dark room, one big dark room, and beyond and to all time we stand. We are wakeful, awry, and watchful. We're awaiting. We are the ones who have a fire inside. We are the only ones we can recognize. Through our bleeding, we are one. Everything Davy Havoc has ever written needs to be taken seriously and literally. These are some pretty heavy words and some pretty heavy statements. How does this affect you? Um, I love my children very much, wholly. Um, and I think I think that and and, and many other examples. Uh, I mean that you could draw from not from you know such extreme ends as as, as the church. It's just kind of an indication that um, I th I think people. I think people gravitate toward us um, on that level because there's there's an honesty in our music and there's there's emotion that's in our music that is very real um, that appeals to a certain group of people who may not have that sort of honesty and have that emotion in other facets of their lives um, and you know I, I think that. If people can find that sort of comfort in us, I, I, I think it's, it's really, really a wonderful thing. And for me, m my words that I write um, are just my feelings. It, it is myself, and I really couldn't, <clears throat> I really couldn't do anything other than what I do. And I really, in expressing who I am and having people appreciate that, um, I really, I really find it just, you know an amazing satisfaction isn't even in the world it's just it's just it's just so uh, 
is so surreal and, and, and wonderful that, that people can appreciate what we do to that to that level. It's, it's cool. Do you think that will ever go away? Like that feeling of like awe and appreciation for your fans? Do you think you'll ever get used to it? I don't think so. It, it hasn't um, it, over the years. I, it, it always strikes me. Um, it, it, it touches me very deeply. Like I, I just the other night. I mean, I had a few kids who came up to me and and explained to me that you know somehow uh, our songs and my words have saved their lives and that they wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for us. And that, that's amazing. I mean, that makes absolutely everything we do so much more worthwhile this is this is what I love to do either way but to have that sort of impact on somebody's life and you know I, I also have I have people come up to me very you know very young kids come up to me and say that they were so deeply involved in drugs until they discovered our band and kind of look more into um, some of our philosophies and now they're totally clean and they said that their lives are completely different and completely better as a result of it and, and thanked me for that and to you know, to make that kind of change in someone's life, I mean, that can never, I can never grow numb to that. You know, how could you? you know. I also have another quote here from Revolver magazine, and this is a quote of yours, and it says, "The state of modern music is horrible. People are going backwards, trying to create music that's already been done several times, or they're doing hybrid music, taking two genres that sound great alone but horrible together." Now, are there any bands out there who are doing it right, in your opinion? Yeah, in fact, since since I made that statement, I I've actually um, I've actually been listening to the, the radio far more than I have then um, since I started playing our song I keep the radio on at all times in, in order to hear it because it excites me every time no matter what no matter how many times I hear it um, and I think it's really gotten a lot better now in fact I know it has because you could turn on the radio and you can hear Fisher Spinner and you could hear Interpol and you could hear Queens of the Stone Age um, and those are those are great bands they're all like authentic real wonderful bands and it's really nice to have that sort of um, refreshing change and I and I think that change continues you know you can hear Sparta on the radio every once in a while and it's it's, it's Jimmy Eat World it's it's uh it's getting a lot better it's nice the uh, radio and the TV is letting these bands filter in like you know Interpol or like the Queens of the Stone Age like real rock bands or bands that actually you know are bucking the trend and I think that's a sign that things are about to change we're about to see a paradigm shift kind of like when Nirvana came in and changed everything and I think everybody kind of wants that kids just don't really know yet I think that, but they're like they're getting tired of everything they're hearing and everything they're being forced to listen to and I think that uh, hopefully we can be part of that it'd be nice to be part of it you know maybe an agent of change and speaking of great albums, I want to mention the Transplants album. You do guest vocals on that. Now, how'd you get involved with that? Because that's an amazing album. Well, I've, we've been friends with Rob and and Tim for years. Actually, I mean, the Transplants was was began as just Rob and Tim together. Um, it was really it was really Rob's project, and I did vocals on that record years ago. Um, yeah, I mean, that record has been in the works for a long time, and uh, you know, I. We, we love those guys. But Rob, Rob used to tour with us. We tour with Rancid. You know, we we really, all of us, all of us really kind of, um, you know, have been in the same family for years. So when Rob recorded the the Quick Death song, and it had kind of a kind of a ministry feel to it, kind of a little KMFDM, little Slayer involved, he said, "This is a song that I want you to sing on." So he and I. Collaborated on the words and the um, and the uh, structure with Tim, and it just came together. At least now, what children's story could be best transformed into a horror story? I, you said children's story, and I immediately started thinking of uh, of the children's stories that I've been reading lately, which are called a series of unfortunate events. A series of unfortunate events. Are you familiar with those? Uh, by Lemony Snicket. Um, those would easily be transformed into a horror story because they're written in, in that vein that nothing positive ever happens. It starts miserably and it ends miserably and it's I think it's really tailored towards adults more than it is children. They're really wonderful children's stories so check those out but um, those would um, any of the, uh, all, the all the Grimm's fairy tales. Yeah, the Grimm's yeah. fairy tales are really, when you when you look at it, they're they're really dark and everything that happens is kind of depressing and there's a lot of death and a uh, it's kind of macabre. 
Yeah, one of those. You know, any, any, I mean, the original Cinderella with the blood and the shoes. And, um, you know, I was just thinking of some of the old fairy tales the other day. I was thinking of Jack and Jill. And I saw it and, and I recited the, the whole, uh, what was, I, I call it fairy tale. It's not fairy tale. It's a, it's a nursery rhyme. Those are dark, too. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down his br- and broke his crown, and Jill came, t- came tumbling well, after. Because when those are written, a lot of those were meant to be these kind of, uh, these parables, like these kind of warnings to children. And so they always had kind of a macabre twist at the end. So, yeah, those are good. Yeah, I haven't read Grimm's Fairy Tales for a long time. I just want to know if uh, there's anything you want to say to your fans out there in, uh, on the web. Yeah, um... We'd really like to thank all of you who have been with us for this long and who, you know, truly understand and, and appreciate what you're doing, what we're doing. Um, I always say this, but really true. Your loyalty and dedication really doesn't go unnoticed, and we really appreciate it. And we hope you continue to be with us from here on. Get off the internet, read a book. <laughs>